Hi, my name is Kelly Elwell. I'm a nurse practitioner for palliative and hospice care at Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. Um, we're going to be discussing dementia and caring for patients with dementia and also caring for the caregiver tonight. So the purple elephant is the symbol for Alzheimer's dementia, which is the most common type of dementia. Purple is the last color that Alzheimer's patients tend to forget. And the elephant is believed to be the only animal that never forgets anything. So tonight we're gonna to discuss types of dementia, common symptoms, how dementia is diagnosed, how to care for a patient with dementia, important tips and tricks, and when is it time for palliative and hospice care? Finally, we'll discuss about how to care for yourselves as caregivers. Alzheimer's disease um, is a buildup of abnormal protein structures in the brain. These are amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, which disrupt communication between the brain cells. This type of dementia makes up of 70% of all cases. Vascular dementia is caused by the interruption of blood flow to the brain, which causes cells to die. And this can be caused by stroke, clot, or vascular disease. This type is the most common type, and it makes up of roughly 10 to 20% of cases. Frontotemporal dementia is degeneration of the brain cells that are located in the frontal and temporal lobes, um, which this area of the brain controls personality, emotions, language, and judgment. And this one's a little bit less common at around 10% of cases. And Lewy body um, is often associated with Parkinson's disease, and it's caused by abnormal structures in the brain cortex, which controls thinking and perceiving and understanding language. Um, this is also not as common, about 5%. So a very layman's um, visual representation of a healthy brain versus a brain with dementia. So a normal brain here symbolized by cheddar is the brain is communicating clearly. The cheese is tightly connected and there's little chance for communication um, malfunctions. The patient is able to function normally with activities of daily living. The brain with dementia or our Swiss cheese has large holes in it where there was once knowledge and understanding. Everyday tasks seem to get harder. Messages send slower and sometimes taking a roundabout route to get through. Eventually, signals are lost forever in these holes, leaving the person unable to complete tasks. A functional decline results in the terminal illness as a patient loses their ability to eat, control their bodily functions, or maintain their immune system. They have increased infections, falls, aspirational events, and become bedbound, which eventually leads to their death. So depending on the area of the brain that has become damaged, the symptoms will vary. So for example, frontotemporal damage results in personality changes, impulsivity, and mood swings, as these are the areas of the brain that control these functions. So patients can also have word finding issues, they can get lost easily, they can have poor insight and judgment, be repetitive in actions or speech, um, have confusion of time or place or season, uh, issues with problem solving and withdrawing from activities. Diagnosis of dementia is a process of both meeting criteria, but also excluding other possible causes for the symptoms that the patient's experiencing. So in order to do this, we complete a, a thorough history and physical exam and including a neuro, neuro, neurological exam. Um, patient would have cognitive testing, which could consist of the slums or the St. Louis Universal University Mental Status Exam, the MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, the MME, which is the Mini Mental Status, and these are all utilized by trained professionals. These tests cannot be utilized alone to diagnose dementia, but it's an additional tool. We also look at subjective and objective clinical data. We do a medical workup to rule out other reversible causes. So we check labs, we look for cancer, we check for infection, um, and also evaluate for psychiatric illness. A slow insidious onset rules out delirium or acute changes in mentation because dementia is a disease that progresses over time.
Stages of dementia include early, middle, and late. And these um, symptoms are not always linear, but they usually follow a predictable pattern. So during the early stage, a patient is often able to cover up for some of their symptoms um, and they hide their dementia from their family and friends. As things progress, there is a sense of loss of control as the patient recognizes that there is a problem, but they're not able to, loot, to cover up um, the loss of function. And during the late stages, it is very apparent that the dementia is present and the patient is not able to cover up for any of these symptoms. And they need significant assistance in most all daily tasks. Once a diagnosis, diagnosis of dementia occurs, there are sometimes as aha moments of realization in both the patient and the family of, oh, this, this kind of was happening for a long time. Um, and that it, sometimes it's months to years before a diagnosis is made. Um, and this picture is a good representation of why it's so important to have advanced care planning conversations early, because as this disease progresses, it's much harder to make decisions. So late symptoms include significant behavioral and personality changes, loss of ability to hold a conversation, difficulty moving, eating, or swallowing, incontinence of both bowel and bladder. They lack awareness of recent activities or surroundings. Um, and that includes time and spatial awareness. Um, and they're highly susceptible to infections such as pneumonia. Hmm. So advanced care planning is the process of exploring wishes, sharing preferences with family or designated agents and completing documents in effort to prepare for the end of your life. This is recommended for anyone over the age of 18, but this is especially important for those with life limiting illness. Early interventions is key with palliative care. Um, this allows for thoughtful decisions with the patient rather than urgent choices. This provides the patient with a sense of self and control um, to document their wishes on paper. It promotes their independence and personhood. It assures caregivers that are not burdened with the decision making, but are able to follow what the patient would have wanted. This will limit unnecessary testing, hospitalizations, painful interventions, and unwanted treatment if wishes are documented. It also facilitates conversations without any pressure on the family to bring this up. Um, you can rely on the palliative care provider to bring it up at a consultation. Um, this decreases anxiety and it feels good to have a plan in place for the patient and the family. And we like to set a positive example to future generations of this is breaking down the stigma of end of life and preparing for end of life. So a little terminology, a healthcare agent um, is a person you would choose to help make medical decisions when you're no longer able to make them for yourself. A living will is a legal document that tells providers how you would wanna be treated in an emergency if you were unable to communicate those wishes on your own. And usually this is drawn up by a lawyer. Um, a durable power of attorney or a DPOA is a legally appointed medical or financial surrogate to make decisions on your behalf. And a guardian is a court appointed legal guardian that makes medical decisions for the patient. Um, and this can happen voluntarily, involuntarily, um, through public guardianship or a family or friend. If a guardian is appointed in any of these situations, a code status cannot be changed without going back to court for permission. Um, and so I would recommend that all of those things be done prior to obtaining guardianship so that if someone was to escalate quickly towards the end of their life, that the, the person that is their guardian could make those choices for them and keep them comfortable. Advanced directives should be done early on in diagnosis of dementia. Um, we should focus on completion of the form and um, because no good decisions happen in the back of an ambulance. Um, an advanced directive is a document that indicates your wishes for medical treatment and it goes into effect if you are unable to speak for yourself. These forms require two witnesses that cannot be family members and they cannot be the person that you named as your healthcare agent. A COLST form is a medical order for emergency medical professionals on how to care for you during um, emergent situations. This is recognized by EMS, hospitals, and provider offices. 
This form indicates your wishes on resuscitation, intubation, the use of antibiotics, the use of artificial nutrition and hydration at the end of life. This form must be signed by a medical doctor, a physician's assistant, or a nurse practitioner. Communication with a patient living with dementia can be difficult, and if a patient doesn't recognize you at first, you should take time to introduce yourself. Um, approach them from the front so that you don't startle them. Have a conversation at eye level. Never argue or disagree with them, but instead try to join their reality. Keep it simple and stick to very short, specific statements. Um, try to reminisce about older memories because those are easier for them to recall. Um, if an upset occurs, acknowledge their feelings, but then try to redirect them to a new topic. Um, and again, don't be, don't be offended if they don't recognize you. That's their disease. It's not them. So communicating to avoid conflict, this is key. Provide clear and concise answers when um, and redirect attention to other things. Remain calm and provide alternate activity or approach questions in a different way. Identify any triggers and try to re remedy them. So instead of arguing, um, we would agree with the patient. Um, don't attempt to reason with them. Instead, try to divert them or distract them. Don't shame an, a patient, um, for example, not having an incontinence episode. Instead of kind of encourage them and, and distract them. Um, Never say, don't you remember? Instead, talk about old memories. Um, they'll get, it sometimes get very embarrassed and very upset if they can't remember something. Um, avoid saying you can't. Instead, tell them what they can do. If they're trying to wander into the street, say, oh, let's walk on the sidewalk. Um, don't force anything. Instead, provide reinforcement. Um, never say, I told you so. Instead, repeat yourself. Never make demands, but ask for permission and never lecture, just reassure safety. Decreasing appetite is common and expected with progressive dementia. Um, never force a patient to eat or drink as this can lead to aspiration and, um, and also mistrust in the relationship. Um, instead, offer finger foods, um, offer foods that the patient pre preferences. Um, choose their favorite dishes. It's common for patients to wanna to graze on snacks rather than sit down for meals. Um, and eating several small meals a day is, is usually preferable among sitting down for three large meals. Avoid hot liquids. Um, this can lead to burns. Patients don't necessarily have the ability to remember that things are hot and that you have to sip it slowly um, and never get straws with, with warm liquids. If swallowing issues do develop, you can seek a SLP consultation for a swallow eval to have that evaluated. If dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, is present, we can utilize thickeners, um, a dysphagia diet or a modified diet, and again, void straws. Um, if the patient is bed bound, uh, elevate the head of bed while they're eating and wait 30 to 60 minutes with it still elevated before laying them flat so you prevent aspiration from the, from the abdomen into the lungs. Bathing and dressing. This is one of the most common issues um, in caring for someone with dementia. The key is to have lots of patience. Their version of reality is much different than a person who isn't suffering from dementia. Um, keep a regular routine schedule. Have everything you need at arm's reach and be very organized. Don't rush the process, but allow adequate time. Explain the process before each step in very simple terms. Ensure that they're comfortable with both temperature and the space that they're in. If they have a shower seat, make sure it's um, the correct size for them. Understand and respect fears. Um, for example, a patient may say they've never showered. Um, some patients have never showered in their minds, meaning that when they were children, they took baths. They may not remember that they showered in the past. And so in their mind, it's something that's totally foreign to them. So you wanna show them the process, walk them through it and talk them through each step as you're doing them. You wanna be flexible and pick your battles. 
Maybe you don't get to wash every area of the patient that day and that's fine. Um, just be flexible in what you are able to accomplish. Limit choices instead of opening up the whole closet and saying, what do you wanna to wear today? Give them two options. Do you prefer the blue shirt or the red shirt today? Um, utilize easy to wear clothing, things that pull over, things that have elastic. Um, perform tasks with the patient to model the behavior, such as combing your hair, brushing your teeth. Um, they may have forgotten how to do those things. And by modeling it, it, it shows them that it's safe to do that. And then try to use their favorite soaps and lotions um, and scents. Aggression is a common behavior that can both be physically and emotionally draining for caregivers. Identify and remove possible triggers to ensure that all needs are met um, using calming redirection. Avoid being argumentative, utilize comforting body language and tone of voice to make them feel safe. Remind them that they are safe and cared for. Embrace their reality. If they think they're going to elementary school and are late for the bus, don't try to convince them otherwise. They do not have the cognitive ability to rationalize these things. Remember that the aggression is their disease and not necessarily who they are. And common factors that cause or worsen aggression is pain, um, medications, interactions of medications, depression or anxiety, fatigue, um, incontinence, constipation or soiled clothing, changes in environment, um, being in a new place, being in the hospital, for example, losses of senses, um, vision, hearing or taste, overstimulation, um, such as temperature issues, being too cold or too hot, loss of control or being forced to do things. Wandering is the need to keep moving when patients are restless or seeking something. Engage patients in activities when wandering occurs. You can utilize door alarms or personal alarms for safety. Often patients seeking to go back to familiar places um, or a familiar time, such as asking to go home or waiting for their parents to pick them up. Um, and this is because they're not recognizing their current surroundings and that's familiar and safe to them. You can remedy any discomfort such as needing to use the bathroom, thirst, hunger, pain, or temperature um, to limit wandering. Patients that have a specific goal, like they're ex exit seeking, and they may be saying they are going to work or picking up the kids or running errands, you can offer them tasks that need completing, folding laundry, um, mm -hmm. sorting papers, redirecting them. Patients that are pacing usually have excess physical energy, so you could take walks with them, do gentle exercise, and frequent change in position or activity. Patients who are bored and just want to experience things, they're, you know, maybe they're used to being on the go. Um, interactive activities, coloring, puzzle, blocks, and fidgets um, are super helpful. Patients that follow caregivers around are seeking reassurance or keeping an eye on their caregiver. To, um, the best thing to do is to provide encouragement or reassurance that they're safe and everything's okay. Disruptive sleep cycles are common with dementia. Sleep is so important for both the patient and the caregiver. Medications such as melatonin and other over-the-counter meds or some prescription sleep aids are beneficial. Attempt to maintain good sleep health for the patient and the caregiver is vital. So you wanna keep a regular routine. Um, in the morning, you wanna get the patient up if they can get out of bed. You wanna open curtains, you wanna change them into daytime clothing. If they're not able to get up, um, changing the bed position if you're able, um, having them look out the window so that they can see that it's daytime. Um, you want them to eat meals out of bed if they're able. You wanna have a bedtime schedule. You know, we put on our pajamas, we brush our teeth, we have soothing music, maybe some low lighting. You wanna avoid stimulating activities such as TV or loud activities at this time and promote a quiet environment. You wanna get up and go to bed at the same time each day if possible. And this isn't gonna be possible forever, so do it while you can. Um, be as active as possible with the patient during the day. 
You want to keep a log of sleep to show their provider so that we can evaluate what medications they're on, when they're getting those medications, when they're sleeping, when they're waking. And that will really help the provider to see what changes need to be made if it's not working. Um, and if at all possible, avoid late afternoon or evening napping. As the disease progresses, that's not gonna be possible um, in all cases. So again, utilizing those, those um, tricks while you can. Sundowning um, is a predictable pattern behavior usually occurring in the early evening. Patients can have increased anxiety, agitation, wandering, exit seeking, aggression or restlessness. Confusion and hallucinations are often worse at these times. Um, you wanna maintain routines, use calming activities to ensure needs are met. You wanna avoid stimulating foods or activities such as caffeine or sweets. Um, you wanna make sure that the environment is comfortable and relaxing. And all efforts should be made to prevent these episodes as once they've started, it's really more difficult to manage a patient that's dysregulated. So prevention with this is key. You wanna keep them safe and prevent elopement. Um, sometimes distracting them with simple chores, folding laundry or other enjoyable tasks helps. Um, again, medications can be used but you wanna use them once you have established a pattern and you are seeing a pattern, you wanna use those to prevent it, um, not necessarily reacting to the sundowning. Falls are very common in the elderly, but especially in dementia, and they are not an indication of a caregiving failure. Falls can occur even with all the best supports in place, um, and many medications can contribute to falls, but this doesn't mean that we shouldn't use medications. It just means that we need to use them carefully and watch for um, polypharmacy or how medications interact with one another. You wanna avoid clutter. You wanna remove rugs and tripping hazards. Ensure that all rooms are well lit, especially at night. Um, utilize grab bars and shower chairs. Wear non-slip socks and shoes even indoors. Place non-skid strips on the floor, showers, and stairs. Um, keep the, the aid in, in reach, the cane, walker, wheelchair, whatever the patient uses, you want it within arm's reach. Remove pets and small children from the area when a patient's getting up to ambulate or changing positions. You can consider having a medical alert button if the patient lives at home. Having a home safety evaluation um, through physical therapy or occupational therapy um, can be really beneficial in identifying trip hazards and possible changes to the home environment to make it more safe. And if you have a fall, um, you wanna have a good plan in place. You don't wanna be reactive, you wanna have a plan. Do you call for lift assist? Do you, does the patient have some medication in the home for pain control? You know, What do you do if they need a hospital visit? So common complications um, in dementia patients are falls and injuries, um, the inability to care for their self um, or self-neglect, um, increased infections, UTIs, pneumonia, aspiration, and wounds, inadequate nutritional intake, protein calorie malnutrition and dehydration, um, hallucinations, paranoia, or fear of medications and foods. Being in the hospital for any length of time is disruptive to patients and their families with dementia. Having clear plans to avoid visits or prolonged stays will reduce stress on both the patient and the caregiver. Another reason why this is really important to do advanced care planning early, um, because sometimes patients can develop hospital acquired delirium from being in a facility and um, it's really difficult to get them regulated and get them back to their normal baseline. When is it time for 24 seven care? Um, if the patient is wandering or exit seeking, if they're getting lost, if they're having falls or injuries, um, if they're having episodes of leaving the stove on or they have to tend to a fireplace, um, if they have issues with impulsivity, if you come to visit and you leave and they forget that you left, 
Um, if they are unable to utilize a telephone correctly, if they can't describe what to do in an emergency or how they would evacuate in an emergency, if they're having frequent hospitalizations for preventable reasons, such as injury or dehydration, and if they're unable to manage their activities of daily living or medications, um, those are all signs. And if a caregiver is uncomfortable leaving a patient for any length of time, it is likely the time for 24 seven supervision. And there are many simple changes that you can make to the patient's environment to prevent injuries and allow them to live independently for a little bit longer um, if it's otherwise safe. For example, if they, you know, their only issue right now is that they forget the stove and they leave it on, then un unplugging that stove, unhooking that stove and, and cooking their meals for them um, is one option. You know, if medication management is their only issue, then maybe that's something that can be done to allow them to live at home a little bit longer. Um, but a home assessment for grab bars and railings, trip hazards, all of those things are, are great tools to use to help patients be safe at home. So this is a FAST score, which is a functional assessment score that determines the stage of dementia. It um, essentially is the reverse of normal human growth and development. So if you look at the top where it says normal aging, um, that is a normal adult that has no deficits whatsoever. And as we progress down into moderately severe dementia and then severe dementia, you see that the abilities um, to care for oneself decreases. And so, and then if you start at the bottom and you look up on 7F, the patient's no longer able to hold the head up, um, that would be kind of baseline of what it would be to be an infant. So you can see that it's, it's the reverse of normal growth and development. For patients um, interested in hospice um, or families wondering when it's time for hospice, a patient can be admitted to hospice um, with a diagnosis of a FAST 7A. So they're only speaking about five to six words a day. They have urinary and, and fecal incontinence. They need help bathing and toileting. They can't select proper attire for the weather. Um, they're not able to cook or clean or pay their bills. Um, and they don't have the ability to complete complex tasks. Now, uh, not all of these things go in that order, um, but usually this is the, the baseline that we use to determine whether a patient's ready for hospice. The medical philosophy of hospice is to provide compassionate care for people in the last phases of incurable disease. Hospice focuses on quality of life, peace, and comfort, rather than curing the disease. They accept death as in the final stages of life, but do not try to hasten or postpone it. Hospice care treats the person and the symptoms of the disease, but not the disease itself. It is a free service that is paid for by Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance to ensure comfort at the end of life. So for dementia patients, they must meet qualifications of a FAST score 7A or higher, and, the elect, and it's a voluntary service, so they have to elect the benefit, um, or their family, their healthcare agent has to elect the benefit. It's a multidisciplinary approach um, to caring for patients at end of life. And it can be provided in the home, sometimes in the hospital setting, in skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, and memory care. The services that are provided are specialized hospice nursing, medical social work, LNA for personal care, chaplaincy, volunteer services, respite stays, end of life planning, symptom and pain management, and bereavement support for the family or loved ones 15 months after the patient passes. Our goals for caring for the caregiver is to make your own health a priority. Oftentimes patients are so focused, uh, caregivers are so focused on the patient that they let their own health slip. Um, so we really want you to make time to make your doctor's appointments, to do your preventative care, to follow up on things that are um, acute or long-term. Um, you wanna educate yourself on the disease process. Uh, you wanna take time away from caregiving. 
utilize your supports and respite care. We want to normalize the frustration and anger at the situation, and we want to learn to manage this. Seek professional end-of-life planning help, such as palliative care or hospice care, um, to help with the process. And we want to try to use hospice care early so that we increase quality of life for not only the patient, but for the family as well. And um, we encourage smile and laughing daily because that's certainly the best medicine. Being gentle with yourself as a caregiver is so important. Um, it is the hardest job in the world. And I think that it, it is a sometimes can be a very thankless job in patients that have dementia. Um, and again, utilizing the hospice benefit, this is a multidisciplinary approach that focus on comfort and quality. Um, and if the disease was to run its natural course without any treatment, life expectancy would be six months or less doesn't mean that that's how long the patient will live. It just means that that is the benefit cutoff period that a provider is willing to say that the patient has six months or less without treatment. Some resources for you. So the Vermont Ethics Network has um, advanced directive forms. They have post forms, they have education on um, medical ethics. Um, Tipa Snow from Positive Approach to Care is one of my favorite resources for dementia. Um, she has a lot of interesting YouTube videos on her website. The National Institute on Aging um, does a lot of work with dementia and um, a lot of good information there. Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice has a wide variety of services, including home health, um, palliative care, PTOT, nursing, um, and hospice. And I will open it up to questions. If you have anything that's in the chat, we can start with those and then more than welcome to um, chime in as well.